Hello everybody and welcome to another T-Rex live stream. This is the T-Rex talk where we talk about uh, communications networks and how to build them. Now, uh, I'll let you know just right off the bat, this is kind of a uh, kind of bait and switch because I'm going to hold up radios and talk about building a communications network and the thumbnail is radios, but the secret ingredient to building the communications network is not hardware, it is software. Uh, the important key component is people. So uh, we're going to talk about radio stuff, but the important components of the network are, in fact, uh, the people. And I'm going to try, because I've said that people are very important and communication is very important, <sighs> I'm going to try to look at the chat. I know I do a terrible job of it on most streams, but uh, I'm going to try to keep an eye out. And then, yep, yep, sure enough, people saying the Fed posting has already begun. So hello to the ATF. Hello to the FBI. Um, yeah, yeah, welcome, welcome. So as we talk about communications networks, um, part of the reason that I'm doing this stream is because I've gotten so many questions after posting various, uh, various videos related to communications equipment and radios and how ham radio works and how business band radio works and how to do ATAC over radio in theory. Uh, that's all theory. I haven't actually got that working in a way that I like uh, yet, but uh, it's, it's getting better. But there are a whole bunch of questions related specifically to which radios to buy. Um, and we've talked about different radios that we like. For example, the traditional uh, standard Baofeng. Actually, this isn't the UV5R. The UV5R is the traditional standard Baofeng. And this right here is uh, one of the 82 varieties, which I actually like. I, I like having the dual push to talk button uh, right here. It's kind of nice. And uh, there's not as many accessories for it, but I, I think it's okay. And then we've talked a lot about the Hytera radios. We're fans of the Hytera radios uh, for digital. And then if you're a ham radio guy, the, uh, these Anytone uh, radios here uh, are also pretty good digital DMR radios. So everybody that asks questions about which radio they should buy, the, the only way to answer that question is to really ask what the specific uh, communications network uh, you have that you're trying to communicate with. What type of communications network are you hoping to build? So one of the things that I really want to get into is, is how important that is. And I got a couple of examples that I want to look at. They, they are historical examples, of course, because uh, I wouldn't want any of the um, Alphabet Boy uh, guys uh, who are watching this, I wouldn't want anybody to get the wrong idea and, and assume that this is insurrectionist type stuff. This is not extremist type stuff. This is not for the future. This is only for better understanding the past. That's all that we are trying to do with this here particular stream about uh, digital radios and communications networks. It's a historical, uh, historical subject. So uh, I got a couple of examples. And to prove that uh, there's not going to be any insurrectionist stuff in here, we're going to be looking at Paul Revere. Uh, absolutely not an insurrectionist in any way, not a government overthrowing type dude at all. Just uh, just a messenger man. That's 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 all he was. Um, technically, <laughs> uh, technically, we're already off topic. Um, but let's let's look at a little more recent example of a communications network. So um, my family moved to the Tennessee area right before a gigantic flood in 2010. So in 2010, there was a gigantic flood in Middle Tennessee. Um, where we were in Hickman County, we had roads wash out, so it was very difficult to get in or out of the county. We had power off for probably about two weeks, which meant the cell phone towers stopped working after about somewhere between 24 and 48 hours, depending on how much fuel each tower had in its uh, generator backup. Um, and then we also had no water for a while. So uh, depending on if you were, if you had uh, city water, you, you had water for a few days and then it was gone for a couple of weeks. So there were a lot of people in the county that needed a lot of different things. But the most important commodity wasn't actually water, it wasn't actually food, uh, it was information. The ability to know who had water, because water came in on trucks, but the ability to find out where that water actually was, which roads were open so you could go and get it, which of your neighbors really needed it uh, the most, these are the things that were really, really important for that disaster management that happened. Um, it was really, really important that people be able to communicate with each other uh, what resources were available, where those resources needed to go, who was capable of moving those resources, and how you could actually move those resources when a bunch of bridges uh, were just out uh, or unsafe or roads had been washed out and leaving the bridges standing in the middle of uh, the new big rivers. So 
that was a fascinating uh, kind of look at when you have a communication breakdown, what it is that you're actually, what limitations you run into. Um, and part of the issue was we were very new to the area. We'd barely gotten to know our neighbors. We hadn't really gotten to know the county very well. So we were at a distinct disadvantage when it came to helping folks. Um, and in a disaster scenario like that, uh, I, I actually believe that this is the case having been to third world countries and having done disaster cleanup in a bunch of different places and so forth, um, information is really the key commodity. Regardless of, of what the other um, resources are that are really desperately needed, the information and the communication is really the important the most important thing that you need to deal with and to fix is the most important thing for dealing with a disaster. So one of the things that became really obvious after that flood, when we didn't know people very well, uh, we, we didn't know which of our neighbors had radios. We didn't know which channels people were talking on. The ability to build a communications network after the disaster had already happened was incredibly limited. Now, there's some ways that you can uh, be better at that. There are some tools that uh, I have now that I didn't have then that would have been incredibly helpful, but building a communications network takes time, and the best case scenario is when you do that in the least stressful situation, not the most stressful situation. So one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest takeaways from that disaster, which at the end of the day is fairly minor, no, no power for two weeks, um, it was actually pretty easy to manage after a while. And one of the things that, that happened was, after a little while, it became obvious that there was a pre-existing community network. There was a communications network that existed in the county. We just weren't a part of it. We just weren't plugged into it. We didn't know who the leaders of that communications network were. We didn't know who, or for, let's use a networking group. We didn't know what the nodes were. We didn't know how we could actually talk, who we had to talk to who would know what other people were doing and what other people were needing. And, um, and yet, over time, as we got to meet different people, we realized a lot of that network was already in place. And it was not built around radios, it was built around relationships and communication um, and trust. So that, you know, in, in a disaster like that, trust is not as much of an issue. In an issue, uh, if, you, if you want to go back to Paul Revere, for example, trust is a huge issue. You want to know that the people inside of your communications network are uh, trustworthy patriots um, and uh, not loyalists, for example. So in, uh, in preparation for um, the war for American independence, the communications networks that were built were heavily built around trust and capability, not just pure access. And so that's the thing that um, in, a, in a different type of disaster scenario like the, the flood in 2010, um, it was just a matter of finding out who needed water, who needed food, and making sure that they could get water and they could get food and finding out how to get it to them. So that is something that I do want to talk about because if you can build those networks and you can build those relationships ahead of time, then you know exactly what sort of radio you need to get. And if you wait until everybody's cold, everybody's hungry, um, nobody has power to charge any radios, even if they had radios, that is not the ideal time to build a network. Now, it is true that in those sorts of emergencies, when uh, people focus on what's really necessary, you can make a fair amount of headway in uh, getting a network built, but you're at a tremendous disadvantage when you lack a lot of resources. So, um, there's a bunch of people who are in the chat asking various questions. Um, and I also want to make the point that we have built, in the 21st century, we've built a lot of communities online. And those communities online are not necessarily the type of communications uh, networks that you really want to, to have in a disaster scenario for a bunch of reasons. For example, number one, uh, <laughs> there are uh, a lot of communities that are kind of built around one-way communication. Like, all of you guys watching this video right now are uh, receiving one-way communication because I'm not really looking at the chat very well. Uh, we're not really part of a community at this moment. We're communicating. This is a communications network, sort of, but we're entirely dependent on YouTube to allow us to talk. Uh, on that note, you should subscribe to our newsletter because that's a little bit more resilient. Uh, you cannot really rely on the big tech companies to connect you in 
certain scenarios. Uh, maybe it's because there's no power running to the cell phone tower that you need to get your internet. Or maybe it's something else that's completely not sinister at all. Um, one of the things that was really interesting uh, for Middle Tennessee was there was a bombing on Christmas Day that destroyed, uh, it looked like <clears throat> it had only looked like it had only destroyed the front of the building, of an AT&T building. And yet it had so damaged a lot of the network switches inside that there was no internet on a huge area of, of cell phone towers. And it wasn't just AT&T cell phone towers, it was the AT&T fiber backhaul for a whole bunch of other service providers. So there was a big, big chunk of guys uh, <laughs> that had no internet uh, over Christmas and the next few days. There is a, a fair amount of fragility inside of our communications networks, and that's why I really appreciate people that are asking the question, what radio should I buy? Because they want decentralized communications that will actually allow them, in a disaster, to have a way to talk without infrastructure. Because there's all sorts of scenarios in which case the infrastructure isn't working, or isn't working properly, or isn't maybe trustable. And uh, so having your ability to do communication outside of those infrastructures uh, those large, complicated infrastructures, um, super helpful. And as we have gotten more and more, uh, feel, excuse me while I put on my grumpy old man hat, as we've gotten more and more technologically advanced, and all the dang kids and their whippersnapper friends are just hanging out on the internet, um, we've kind of lost a lot of the <laughs> social ability to uh, operate off of social media platforms, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, that would be super handy in uh, disaster scenarios. And it was actually kind of interesting to see when we had the um, Christmas internet outage, uh, I think that, that actually made for better Christmases for certain people. And when we had the, the flood in 2010, that actually was in, in many ways a community building experience in a lot of ways. Neighbors depending on one another and having conversation with one another and building, uh, building relationships as they took care of one another. Uh, it was very heartwarming but everyone was also really happy when the electricity came back on. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about radios. In different scenarios, you're going to want different things. So let's just compare, for example, these two radios. The, the Baofeng radio is cheap and it is an analog FM radio. Uh, this one here operates on UHF and VHF frequencies, so you can use it um, as a ham radio, you can use it in those two bands, and it is not encrypted in any way, and you can talk and listen on those frequencies to anyone else who's using those frequencies. You can technically, but not legally, talk on FRS and um, GMRS and MERS frequencies with this radio to people who are using the Walmart blister pack FRS radios. You can listen to those frequencies. Um, well, you can listen to those frequencies legally, but you couldn't possibly uh, communicate uh, on those bands, uh, on those channels, uh, legally, even though it's super easy to program your radio to talk on those because it is totally within the radio's capability uh, to transmit on those frequencies and it's totally within the uh, antenna's capability to transmit, transmit on those bands. So in many ways this would be a really handy emergency radio to have with you if you did not have a pre-existing communication plan because you could listen and talk to a lot of the handheld radios that are out there that people store for disaster scenarios. The problem is you don't know what channels they're on and it's very difficult to actually turn on this radio and scan, even with the scan function, it's very hard to have this radio scan through the frequencies slowly, 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 and actually be on the right frequency at the exact same time that somebody is using it so that you know what you actually need to be on. So it's so much better if you can ahead of time figure out what your neighbors actually have, and uh, what it is that they're actually wanting, uh, wanting to do with their radios. Um, you don't even know at what times people are going to have their radios on. If, if you're like me and you don't do a great job of keeping your radios charged, you may only have an hour or two of battery inside of your radio. And uh, if my power goes out early in the morning and I use this radio to call for help, and then the battery goes out, and that's when you drive through my neighborhood to see if there's anybody asking for help, we have just missed each other. So. Think through how you're going to power your radio equipment as well. That's a very, uh, very important thing. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, you may have your communication uh, network already built up. You may already have the people that you specifically want to talk to, and you know exactly what radios they have, and you coordinate together to get radios um, 
that are a little bit more advanced, like this Hytera radio, and now you're using DMR. So DMR is uh, my current favorite digital protocol for, for radio use. You get, um, I don't know how much actual extra efficiency you get. You get a little bit better range, you get a little bit better error correction, you get a little bit better battery efficiency. Um, but one of the main reasons that you would want DMR is there are fewer people using it, so it isn't going to interfere with other people as much. And other people that don't have DMR radios, uh, they won't be able to hear what you're talking about. So if your goal with your communications network is to be a little more exclusive, then you could go with digital radios because there are fewer of them out there. Now, it doesn't make you uh, completely undetectable, and it doesn't mean that nobody can understand what you're saying. It just means that average people that have analog radios cannot understand what you're saying. And if you are on a business band radio, you have your itinerant business band frequencies license, you can then use encryption. And the Hytera radio allows you to use proper 256-bit AES encryption if you have the right model. And you can even do rotating keys and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Um, but all that that's doing is making it harder for people to talk to you. If your goal with your radio is to find other people, this radio doesn't necessarily help you do that, even though it can listen to analog radio. Um, but the main purpose of this radio is to be harder for other people to listen to you. Now, uh, it also, I would say, it doesn't make you undetectable. <laughs> Any radio that transmits uh, RF signal is going to be transmitting RF signal that other people can see and triangulate uh, whether it's encrypted or not. So if your goal is to be invisible, radios kind of, that's not really what they do. A, a radio is, from an electromagnetic spectrum sense, like shining a giant flashlight up into the air and telling people um, something inside of the signal of that giant flashlight. So it's, it's really not that hard to see that, that signal. Uh, which brings me to the second piece of equipment that I want to talk about. Uh, if, I am a, <clears throat> um, if I'm somebody who finds myself in a natural disaster or an unnatural disaster, and I want to find out who out there is talking to each other. Are there people who are stuck in their houses and their only means of communication is a Baofeng radio or a Walmart uh, off-the-shelf blister pack radio? Uh, a cool way to find those folks um, is with a, uh, a SDR, a software-defined radio like this little teeny USB guy right here. So this is a RTL SDR. And all that you need to do is plug it into a USB port on something. And then uh, if you have a phone with USB-C, you can just use a regular USB-C dock, plug it in. And now you can see a huge amount of the spectrum at the same time. Uh, I see some folks in here asking about frequency skipping radios. Uh, back in the past, uh, a long time ago, those frequency hopping radios used to be really hard to detect and really hard to intercept. But because this SDR right here sees so much of the spectrum, uh, it's actually not lit very well, but you can see just how incredibly tiny this is. And you can put a bunch of different antennas on it. It can see a huge swath of the spectrum. It can see uh, everything that these radios can, can transmit and listen to, but way more than that. Um, this is an RTL SDR like most of them, but it has, this one is from newelect.com, and uh, it has an aluminum housing. Basically, all of these use the exact same chips inside, and they just have, uh, you know, different heat dissipation or different antenna connectors. So these are 20 to 40 bucks. And uh, if you go to uh, Terminal, are you on here? Uh, terminal Advantage? I can't believe I just forgot your name. Um, there are folks that sell kind of more tactical setup so that they have already gone out and picked the version that you want that is more rugged and so uh, put together some training materials on these. But basically, once you have this connected to your phone and you're running the right app or connected to your computer and you're running the right program, then you can see a huge swath of the spectrum. You can see HF stuff. You can see super high frequency stuff. Um, and you can see huge swaths of the spectrum at the same time. So you can see all of your... UHF signals and all of your VHF signals at exactly the same time. And even if there's a frequency hopping radio that bounces between frequencies, you see all of the channels streaming down in your waterfall display. So it is super easy. Um, it is super easy. I'm not going to do the quote. 
It's super easy to see frequency hopping radios once you have a software defined radio receiver that can look at the entire band or look at multiple bands at the same time. And one of the cool things about a device like this and uh, being able to plug it into your phone and the thing I like about uh, a USB-C dock like this is once you plug this in and then you plug a battery pack in and then you plug your phone in, um, you can actually watch and record spectrum for a long time. And that would be a great way to actually, as you are doing disaster management or as you are exploring or as you are looking for people to help, that's a great way to see a wide area of the spectrum and know like, oh, there's some people with FRS radios over here. Um, and then you can take your radio and program it over to F FRS frequencies. Um, or your, no, actually what you would do to be legal, of course, is to pull out your FRS radio that is separate and Part 90 certified and uh, it's legal for you to do this. And then you can talk to those folks on their frequency. Now, there is, there is a little bit of uh, research and study required to use this properly because the apps that exist do not give you a whole lot of user-friendly information right off the bat. Like they do not tell you, oh, this channel over here is clearly uh, somebody calling for help on FRS channel 15. Um, there's nothing quite like that. You have to learn how to interpret the signals a little bit. It's not that difficult, but all of this stuff takes study if you're going to do it properly, if you're going to do it with any capability. Um, so it really depends on what you are trying to accomplish. This, this question of which radios do I buy? Which skill sets do I need to develop? What thing do I need to study? Really heavily dependent upon your use case, uh, your mission, and ideally you have a communications network in place so that as you are doing stuff in a disaster scenario or doing whatever type of emergency communications uh, you need, you're not the only one doing it, you're not operating alone, and you already have enough of a plan that your buddies, even if you have uh, limited, uh, limited battery capability, you know which frequencies you're going to be on and what times you're going to be transmitting. Um, you e even may need to know what places you're going to go to meet up to talk to each other uh, and whether or not you need to get to a top of a hill to actually transmit to the neighborhood that they're in. Stuff like that you need to figure out ahead of time so you're not experimenting with this um, in a disaster scenario. When I was uh, a volunteer firefighter, uh, our county is very geographically large and we don't have very many repeaters. So there were a lot of times where we would respond to an incident and then somebody's job was to kind of wander around and figure out where we could hit the repeater from. <laughs> because uh, there was just a huge amount of the county that had some cell phone signal and a huge amount of the county that had some repeater signal and uh, a huge amount of the county that had neither. So every time we responded to an event, uh, it was always a little bit of an experiment as to figuring out whether we could actually talk back to dispatch or how we were actually going to communicate with people on scene, etc. Communicating on scene is usually pretty easy because you switch over to a uh, TAC channel and then everybody that's on scene can hear each other on that TAC channel and then you switch over to your repeater channel and then hopefully you can see the repeater and you can talk back to dispatch. So as you're building your communication plan and your network you can figure out whether or not you have the infrastructure uh, yourself, whether you can put up repeaters and cover a little bit more of your area, um, that sort of thing. Uh, time for a T-Rex repeater deployment. Um, yes, we have a DMR repeater that we need to set up. We haven't really had the time to work on that, but it's on our, our to-do list. Um, somebody mentioned earlier that you don't need to worry about the FCC regulations in an emergency if there's a disaster. That is technically true, but it, it's kind of up to them to define an emergency. So if your life is in danger, the, the precedent is, if your life is in danger, you can absolutely use any means necessary uh, to ask for help. You can break into the local FM transmitter, the country radio station, and you can ask for help on that giant um, two kilowatt transmitter. That is a crime under most normal circumstances, but if you need help, you can do that. Now, if you're trying to get help for other people, that's where uh, there's not as good a precedent. Um, I would say it's kind of hard to get in trouble with slightly improper radio use in a disaster, but uh, it's one of these things that varies. I feel like the uh, <laughs> I feel like the FCC is a not up to date and b uh, not actually helping with most of the things that it uh, could be doing in this instance. <laughs>
Um, for ham radio emergency communications, there's pre-existing communications networks like RACES and ARES, and those are folks, those are organizations that you may be able to talk to. Um, there may be others in your area. There's, uh, a, I forget the acronym, there's a different one here in Middle, uh, middle Tennessee area. It's an emergency radio network, and they basically exist to uh, help in disasters. So they have a way of talking to their local sheriff or maybe EMS or maybe EMA and help communicate with other counties and other people uh, when phones are down or various other communications, uh, things are not available. Um, so there's, uh, you know, someone here says, if you were to broadcast illegally during a, uh, during a disaster where you're not directly in danger, they might throw the book at you for reasons that they might not throw the book at someone else if you catch the drift. Yeah, definitely uh, don't take a Baofeng radio into uh, any capital buildings during uh, January 6th. That's probably like, it's probably gonna get, uh, get a book thrown at you at some, some time. So uh, a bunch of people asking questions about Mesh-tastic transmitters. I'm very excited about the Mesh-tastic project. I don't actually have a whole lot of time experimenting with it, but um, that's on my to-do list. Uh, people asking about super low cost quality radios. The Baofengs, the Baofengs are kind of hard to beat. And the reason that I say that is just because of how cheap they are and how many of them are already out there. If you want to learn about radio technology, you should get your ham radio license and you should get a Baofeng. You probably shouldn't stick with the Baofeng, but you should have a Baofeng and you should know how to program Baofengs because there are just so, so many of them out there. Um, uh, terminal Armament, that's your name. I, I forgot for a moment. Term, terminal Armament uh, is the guy who is selling SDR stuff and doing some SDR uh, education. <coughs> post, your, post your URL in here and I'll read it out. Um, so the Baofeng radio, there's a couple reasons why it's not an amazing radio. One is, it is the build quality is actually better than you might expect for a 20 $25 radio, um, but it's not amazing. It's not as waterproof as you would probably like, or at least the batteries are not as waterproof as you would probably like. Um, and as far as a radio goes, the, the front end is not amazing. There's spurious emissions. There's stuff that for ham radio stuff and for just professional equipment stuff, it is lower grade. But there's also plenty of situations in which this is totally the way to go because you can experiment. You need to know how these things work because everybody has them. You're going to be finding people buying and selling and asking for advice and asking for help with their bow fangs for the next 50 to 100 years, uh, I'm assuming. So you ought to know how to use these. And the things like spurious emissions that, that potentially cause interference and problems. Um, when you're in the middle of rural Tennessee and you're running a 4-watt radio, I have to say I, I care a little less about that than... Uh, <laughs> other places or other times. Uh, yes, I, I would prefer all of my wattage to be focused uh, onto the exact frequency that I want to transmit on, but you know what? Out in the middle of the woods. Um, be careful who you are communicating with. Very true. Uh, you should assume that you are, um, the FCC says never say broadcasting when you're, when you're doing this. You should say transmitting, but you should assume that you are broadcasting. Uh, because you are broadcasting your information widely. Even if you are running an encrypted radio, you are broadcasting uh, your location. And if you're running an unencrypted radio, you are broadcasting whatever it is that you are saying. Uh, technically, that's not the right term for the FCC, but as far as OPSEC goes, broadcasting is absolutely what you should, uh, what you should call it. Get a combo guy in your family or in your group. That is an extremely important thing. Not everybody has to be a combo guy, but you need to have a group and your group needs to have a combo guy in it. If you have no group, then you're going to find yourself potentially, I mean, hopefully you are able to do this, but you're gonna find yourself potentially building a communications network ad hoc with few resources, with no planning and with no assistance, and it's not gonna go super well. Um, uh, a bunch of people ask questions about Gotenna Pros and things. Okay, so this is the Gotenna Mesh. It is not the Gotenna Pro. I, I am annoyed by the software that you actually run on your phone. But basically, you, you pair this using Bluetooth to your phone, and then you actually have a, a small transmitter inside of here that is able to send your message out. And not just from device to device, but if you have more than one device out there, 
your message will hop from device to device. So it, a mesh network is actually created between multiple devices. There's also something similar called uh, Beartooth. Beartooth gives you a little bit extra capability in the form of voice. This allows you to send text messages and your GPS location. The Beartooth device allows you to send text messages, your GPS location, and voice messages. And uh, it actually works way better than I thought. The voice messages send almost instantly. But part of the reason for that is this doesn't do mesh networking yet. It's supposed to come uh, this year. I am curious to see if that happens. Uh, if it does, it would be an interesting and very useful device. Um, it's extremely small. It just connects using Bluetooth to your phone, and then you use your phone to interact with the device. The software for both of these things is not amazing, but it's kind of a useful tool. And one of the, one of the advantages that it does have uh, over an analog FM radio, potentially, is that with this analog FM radio, I need to have a pre-existing plan to talk to people and try to find the right frequency that they are on in order to talk to them. If everybody in my community had a GoTenna mesh, my phone would just connect to this GoTenna mesh, and then this GoTenna mesh would connect to the other GoTennas, and then I would just see who's out there. And I could broadcast to everybody that's in range, <coughs> excuse me, or I could send a message to a specific person that I know uh, and have in my contact list from ahead of time. So there are some ways where this actually helps you discover and build that ad hoc mesh network, um, but only if everybody else is using this device. So you kind of need to get people on board with using this device to build your ad hoc network ahead of time when it's not actually technically ad hoc anymore. So yeah, the GoTenna Pro is five watts with external antenna. Yes, the GoTenna Pro is much better. The GoTenna Pro, however, is also incredibly expensive and you need proper licensing to use it. So the GoTenna Pro has better hardware and a better app but it's, it's, uh, it's harder to get into. So couldn't get my GoTenna mesh to work over half a mile in urban environment. Yeah, it's, this operates at 900 megahertz, and so there's gonna be a lot of 900 megahertz signal interference uh, in urban environments. It goes a little bit further <coughs> in a rural area, but you'd be better off with UHF or VHF radios. So yeah, my local EMS went digital, so you can't scan. Um, it depends. There's a lot of scanners that cannot detrunk traffic, but there's software for um, SDR radios that can detrunk traffic. They can't necessarily uh, decrypt it, um, but they can detrunk it. So it kind of depends on what your local guys are doing. So, <coughs> people asking about ATAC, Hammer, ARPS. I. I, I need to get back into my research and experiment with some of that stuff before I actually make recommendations about it. Um, but you should definitely um, be thinking and experimenting about radios. But the important thing that I, I want to get to now is uh, the fact that <laughs> the software matters a lot more than the hardware. The, the important part of the network is the people, not the equipment. So. Uh, this is a book that we have recommended before, Paul Revere's Ride, and it talks about specifically uh, Paul Revere's Ride. Uh, it talks mostly about that, that uh, very famous ride uh, that he made in 1775, April 19th, where he went out and he told people on the way to Lexington and Concord. He didn't make it all the way to Concord, but he told people along the way that the British regulars were marching and they were going to confiscate stuff uh, at Concord. And... That is what actually allowed the militia to come out and be organized enough that they were able to fight the British. And that was really the beginning of the war for American independence. It did not uh, actually start um, on July 4th, 1776. It actually started April 19th, uh, 1775. That was, that was the shot that was heard around the world. That was the, um, the bell that could not be unrung. That started wheels in motion that couldn't be stopped and uh, American independence was, the, the war for American independence was inescapable. At that point, it wasn't clear who was going to win, but at that point, it was pretty clear that war was inescapable. And when you read this book of Paul Revere's Ride, um, there's two ways to read this book. The first is just as a pure history book talking about what happened, who was involved, where they went, etc. 
The other way to read this book is as an after action report on one of the most important uh, intelligence and communications operations in American history. And if you do that, a whole bunch of stuff gets revealed in this book. And the first is that Paul Revere is not just a messenger guy. He is actually the, uh, not the head, but one of the most important central nodes in a whole bunch of different communications networks that were pre-existing and already set up so that when the time came for people to be ready, they knew exactly what they were getting ready for, they knew exactly who to trust, they knew exactly who to talk to, they knew exactly who to call out, they knew exactly what lingo to use, uh, they had signals set up, and again, Paul Revere set all of this up without radios. All of his communication equipment was pens and paper and horses and other guys on horses and lanterns. That was, that was all the communications equipment that he had. And yet there was a very effective and sophisticated communication that, the network that existed between, uh, between people. So that is something that we should look into and we should, we should study. Um, we should study different times in history where disaster management or and any time when communication really mattered. You should look at the way that um, resistance fighters during World War II used communi communications uh, technologies or communications methods or the way that they built out their networks to communicate within resistance units or the way that they communicated back out to allies. Um, these are really important things to study because they, they help you really see what some of the key fundamentals of a communications network are and how you build those things out. And Paul Revere is an excellent example of this. Um, again, we usually think of him as just purely the, um, the guy who saw something, jumped on his horse, ran around and told people, uh, but it's actually so much more complicated than that. Uh, in many ways, we were, we were talking about him earlier. Uh, Paul Revere shows up over and over and over again in Revolutionary War history. There's important events, and Paul Revere is just there. So either he is the Forrest Gump of Revolutionary War history, and he just is at all these important events purely by accident, or Paul Revere is actually the Tony Stark of the Revolutionary War, and he is actually making stuff happen. He is actually the support network or the support guy for stuff that is happening. And if you read through his stuff, um, his life and the things that he did, it becomes really obvious that he was a key organizer uh, of the systems that worked. Uh, now, not everything he did worked out well. For example, uh, he was an artillery officer for a while and that didn't go too well. He was actually kicked out of uh, command <laughs> because that was not something that he was particularly good at. But he made cannons that were used by um, artillery divisions and battalions, and he was just involved in a whole bunch of different stuff. You probably know a little bit about him. Um, he was a silversmith and he was a goldsmith, um, and that meant that he had a business. He had a business that gave him resources to actually build and cultivate a network. Um, he had enough spare time where he could actually build out networks like the Sons of Liberty. He was very much a part of some of these groups that were discussing things, um, ideology, but they were also discussing things like intelligence. They were discussing things like how many British soldiers are here, which British ships are arriving, what is actually going on at the command level, what is actually going on at the company level, what, uh, have you noticed any British spies walking around and spying out the countryside? Are they, which particular roads are they checking out? This is the sort of stuff that was being talked about very heavily by a lot of very organized people who were also being very careful. And one of the things that, um, that comes out is these face-to-face relationship-based networks uh, were the most important part of, of all of what happened. So there were some tremendous advantages that the American colonists had at that time, and, and they did a really good job of making the most of those advantages. So their biggest home court advantage at the beginning was the existing relationships within communities. So that it was very easy for them to spot spies. It was very easy when the British would send out soldiers uh, in plain clothes uh, to go look around and pretend to be surveyors or whatever. Uh, it was very easy for people on the ground to recognize them as being outsiders, recognize them as not really fitting in, to recognize that the things that they're looking at have strategic or tactical importance because the guys on the ground are part of militias and they're part of conversations about what the British Army is doing. And so rather than being kind of clueless and just seeing a guy not knowing who he is or where he came from or what he's doing, 
they were looking with a pretty careful eye and saying like, oh, this guy is looking specifically at bridges. He's looking at the width of bridges so that he knows how many men can march across them. He's looking at the quality of ro roads so that he can have a rough idea of how long it's going to take a company of British regulars to get from A to B. Um, they were thinking in these terms, and so they were actually able to gather useful intelligence very quickly and pass it around very quickly. And the relationships inside of these communities were strong enough that people had um, a rough idea of who they could trust and why and how much they could trust them and with what information. These were all things that the American colonists uh, could have had or could not have had if they were kind of lazy at developing those relationships or lazy at developing those skills. But because they weren't lazy at those things, they were actually organized, they were actually careful, they were actually thinking about the future, um, they were prepared and they were able to use all of those advantages. Um, they had those capabilities in their toolbox. Um, and that was incredibly valuable as it turned out. Um, and, and you can see Paul Revere's um, you can see Paul Revere as an organizer in a bunch of different ways, <laughs> but uh, he also did some interesting things uh, as far as disseminating information. So he was a goldsmith and a silversmith. That meant that he also was an engraver. He engraved a bunch of the printing plates that were used to print uh, political pamphlets. And uh, so he drew political cartoons and things. And so one of his most famous uh, drawings that you probably have seen is he drew and published the most uh, popular or the most widely spread pamphlet on the Boston Massacre. Um, you've almost certainly seen uh, his artwork if you've seen any Boston Massacre pamphlets. So Paul Revere is working to develop networks uh, in a bunch of different ways. And, uh, and yet at the same time, he's also being careful and cautious. So even though he is, so, and some people have criticized him uh, for this because they say that it's hypocritical that he would publish pamphlets about the Boston Massacre that are anti-British. But at the same time, as a, uh, I believe that he was an eyewitness, but as a uh, very important community figure, as, as a sort of father of the, uh, of the town, he actually showed up and provided testimony at the trial of the British soldiers uh, who were on trial after the Boston Massacre. And the testimony that he provided was actually uh, exoner helped to exonerate those British soldiers. So some people have said, ah, he's just playing both sides against the middle. Ah, he's just being hypocritical. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think that he was actually able to say two things at the same time. First, the British should not be here and should not be stationing soldiers here. But at the very same time, in this particular instance, these particular soldiers are not at fault. So. Um, as he was developing these networks and communicating these ideas and growing his business and growing his influence and growing his relationships with people, uh, he ended up developing an intelligence agency called um, The Mechanics. <coughs> and I think this may have been the first uh, proper uh, intelligence agency in, in the United States. Um, Elias Boudinot ran a pretty significantly successful spy ring, but Paul Revere may have been building out the mechanics ahead of time, but he had uh, actual guys running around gathering intelligence for him, and they were called mechanics, and that's uh, a very interesting thing. <laughs> uh, again, he is, he is the Tony Stark of the Revolutionary War. He is not, uh, he's not just some random guy on a horse. Um, and so as, as you take the opportunity to study stuff, um, like when we recommend books like Paul Revere's Ride, there is uh, so much that you can pull out of a book like that. There are ideological lessons. There are lessons about uh, troops facing off against one another. Uh, and yet, there's also a bunch of lessons about uh, the kind of communication networks that allowed uh, organized stuff to happen. And there were a bunch of different, um, there were a bunch of different, what's, what's the right word for this, Ryan? Uh, there's a bunch of different launching pads or on-ramps or there's a bunch of different starting points for community and communication networks that he was able to utilize. They're a little harder to utilize today. Like, um, uh, oh, we talk about how every, every one of the founding fathers was some kind of conspiratorial Freemason. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty uh, common Nicolas Cage uh, conspiracy theory. That's not actually true, although it, it does happen to be true about Paul Revere. He was a Mason, and his particular uh, lodge uh, was full of Sons of Liberty guys. So inside of this book, the, this is the David Hackett Fisher book, uh, this much of it is this much of it is the story of what happened, and then the rest of it is appendices and footnotes. So when, when you ask him what his sources are, he doesn't say, trust me, bro. He has 
pages and pages of sources. And he has uh, his research that he's documented. So he has a list of several uh, liberty-based organizations. These are, these are uh, they're not clubs, they're organizations. So one of them was the St. Andrew's Freemason Lodge, uh, the Masonic Lodge, uh, which was founded in 1762. Then there's the Loyal Nine. Then there's the North Caucus. Then there's the Long Room Club. Then there's the Tea Party. Then there's the Boston Committee of Correspondence. And finally, in 1775, the last one that was founded was the London Enemies List. Um, they call themselves the London Enemies List. And then he has pages of people who are members of these groups. And some people are members of one or two. But when you look at Paul Revere, he's members of almost, uh, almost all of them. He's members, uh, he, he is a, a good member in good standing of five different uh, liberty groups. This isn't even counting the Sons of Liberty, which wasn't a secret organization. It was uh, a bunch of people who were being very public about talking about liberty. So, um, and when we talk about the Sons of Liberty, I, I don't, I don't want you to to miss how prepared people actually were. So, for example, when Paul Revere knew that the British were coming and they were coming by sea, and he started to ride. He rode to Lexington and he found himself inside of um, the town of Lexington. And one of the first places he went was the home of Jonas Clark, who was the pastor of the church there. And churches were a pre-existing network. In addition to all of these different um, patriot networks, all these different uh, liberty networks, uh, churches were a pre-existing community network. And the, the preacher there, Jonas Clark, was a very important organizer of this very important network. And so that was, I believe, his first stop in Lexington. And when he got there, um, John Hancock and Sam Adams were already there. They didn't know that the British were coming right then, but they were doing network maintenance. They were doing relational building. They were talking about stuff that they knew was coming, even though that they, they didn't know that it was coming that night. They were already there to ask Jonas Clark the very important question of, is your church, church ready to fight? Is your church capable of fighting and are they ready to actually stand up to British soldiers? This is the kind of work inside of the network that was being done. And it just so happened that it was being done on the very night that Paul Revere was making his ride. And so when he was asked if his church would fight, uh, Jonas Clark said, I have trained them for this very hour. They would fight and if need be die too under the shadow of the house of God. So there has been a huge amount of development of all of these networks and militias and thoughts. There's been ideological communication. There's been lines of communication opened up between different towns and communities as people discuss these things in pubs uh, and, you know, you know, Masonic lodges sometimes. Um, and when you get into a lot of this, um, the study of, of these organizations and these relationships, you realize how much work was actually done ahead of time. It wasn't just a whole bunch of people who were starting to get tired of Britain, and then a guy that they didn't know who he was came running through the town, yelling at the top of his lungs, and they were like, all right, fine, let's go shoot some dudes. Um, they knew exactly who Paul Revere was. Paul Revere knew exactly who to tell, and he didn't run yelling through the streets. He went to specific people to let them know what the actual intelligence was of what the enemy was doing on the ground. And the relationships of all of these people were pre-existing relationships built around conversations uh, like, what are we going to do if the British regulars show up? That is the conversation that John Hancock and Sam Adams were having with Jonas Clark when Paul Revere showed up to say, that conversation is super relevant, you guys. It's happening tonight. And uh, uh, you also see a lot of organization happening around the churches, just a ton of sermons um, that are being preached on the issue of just warfare, on the issue of resistance to tyrants. Uh, guys like Jonathan Edwards uh, had, had spent a huge amount of time talking about just war theory. It was, it was pretty ingrained in the culture. And that is why um, when the Lexington militia gathered, they gathered under the leadership of John Parker, who was the deacon of Jonas Clark's church. Um, and they, they were the first militia to actually engage um, the, uh, the British regulars. So uh, our, our founding fathers were very, uh, they were very focused and, again, when we talk about the Founding Fathers, we're talking about uh, hundreds of people who have very different goals and ideologies and reasons for things. And yet, one thing that they do all have in common is they were very network-focused, and they worked very closely together, and they sought unity, and they really wanted to um, be in good communication with one another and have each other's backs. And so that is something that um, 
is a really important part of a communications network, particularly when you're not dealing with just a pure natural disaster. You are dealing with uh, a situation that's a little more complex, and uh, you really you really want to have your connections uh, based more on more on trust than 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 anything else. And so, what happens in uh, in April uh, 19th, 1775? We all know the story. They knew the British were coming. They knew that the British were almost certainly coming to confiscate powder and shot and cannons in Concord. They fought with them, and they they won a couple. They won a battle. Uh, a physical battle, but they also won an ideological battle and a political battle in the way that they fought back. Uh, and they could only do that because of the preparation that existed. Not, not just the preparation uh, because they heard ahead of time from Paul Revere that the British were on the way, but a lot of preparation ahead of time uh, within these communication networks. So I don't want us to get too distracted and too focused on which radio should I buy. Um, because that's the question that you ask after you already know what you're trying to accomplish with your communication network and roughly what it is. So earlier I saw someone say, uh, is this, <laughs> is this the, uh, the live stream that teaches you how to make friends? And someone replied, no, this is the live stream that tells you uh, that you do need to make friends. That's, uh, <laughs> that's probably pretty well said. Um, so yeah, I want to thank you guys for, for watching. This is going to have to be a slightly shorter live stream because we're filming some other stuff in the studio, but I want to take a couple of other questions and just talk through a couple of different, um, couple of different radio things because I know that that is what you are actually here for. One of the most fascinating things about um, modern radio technology is uh, there are all kinds of very cool options that are, are potentially there. So one of the things that... Uh, that I think that we should be experimenting with is stuff like Mesh-tastic, various other Mesh-related uh, radio technologies. There's a whole lot of stuff that is extremely cool from a emergency communication standpoint. And as good as these uh, off-the-shelf FM radios, this is, this is for the most part fairly old technology. And you should own it, you should know how it works, you should be capable. This should be a tool that is in your toolbox, both physically but also mentally. Um, but there's also some really cool stuff that could be developed. There's, there are potentially ways to connect some of these uh, more advanced technologies together to build something that is extremely effective and capable and cool and easier to use uh, and more just better at all the stuff that radio is supposed to be doing. And um, so hopefully we can keep tinkering and experimenting with stuff like that. Meshtastic is probably the most interesting project at the moment on, on, that, uh, on that front um, that I'm aware of. But... Um, yeah, that's only for, for short range, shortish range communication. For long range communication, that's a whole other thing. Um, and long range communication is something that, again, the war uh, for American independence, a really important part of the war for American independence is that when this battle uh, on the way to Concord, the, the first shot that was uh, heard around the world that was fired at Lexington on Lexington Green, one of the really important parts of that that battle is America was the first to get the account of that back to Europe. So the American account of what happened was what was in the European newspapers and the British newspapers. So long uh, range communication also extremely important, but that is a whole nother stream. So uh, yes, there's a bunch of people asking questions about uh, public communication and uh, people watching. Yes, you should assume that public communication is always being watched. Um, especially now. That's, that's always been true to some extent, but the technological capabilities of certain people uh, to watch everything um, have only, only been increased by all the centralized communication that we have. That's part of the reason that I like decentralized communication, devices that work without infrastructure. They're not necessarily going to be harder to watch, but they're definitely harder to control. I mean, right now, there was a discussion this past week um, with Joe Biden and the Biden administration talking about how Yes, there's almost complete control over the conversation about certain pandemics <coughs> and certain, uh, oh, what are they called? Certain mandatory vacations um, that uh, there's currently, currently any conversation about that stuff on social media gets flagged and tagged and you see a, uh, a banner that tells you where you can get approved information on these topics. But that's not happening with face-to-face uh, -face communication and it's not happening over your um, just regular phone calls and text messages. And they're talking about bringing that to uh, SMS communication. So if you just text somebody on your phone, 
somebody will see that and make sure that your friend receives the approved information about what it was that you were trying to talk about. So that is another reason that uh, more decentralized communication is better, and face-to-face -face communication. So, you know, one of the things that worked incredibly well for our founders was the ability to sit down face-to-face, -face, see one another in, uh, in a pub, like the Green Dragon pub, and um, so, yeah, it's really important to build some of those relational, trust-based things with actual human beings, uh, not with random, random internet handles that uh, probably, probably ATF guys, like, most of the time. Uh, anytime somebody on the internet <coughs> tells me that um, I should really have a short-barreled shotgun, uh, I assume that he's an ATF agent. And uh, I, I, rarely, I rarely check, but it seems like, I feel like it's a pretty good guess. Um, Google is also creating mesh, mesh networks, uh, and Amazon is. Amazon is creating mesh networks with some of their uh, different Amazon devices. So this is, this is fascinating technology. It's very cool, and I think that it is, uh, it's double-edged sword stuff. So this is technology that can be used for good or for evil. It kind of depends on who has it. Um, I think we should be experimenting so that we have uh, more people doing stuff with the technology so that we have more competition as consumers. Uh, we can pick... Uh, different types of double-edged sword that are pointed in different directions, shall we say. Um, face to face communications being limited over the last year is interesting when thought of in that context. Yes, face-to-face -face communication is harder um, based on a bunch of stuff that happened last year. And it was replaced primarily with online communication that can be, you know, monitored and addressed a little better. Definitely something to think about. Uh, definitely spend more time getting to know people face-to-face. Uh, it is very, very important. That is the most important part of building a communications network, uh, I think. So, uh, thank you very much for watching. And I want to finish. I want to finish this uh, by reading a quote of one of the Minutemen that responded in Lexington, and it's something that is very important when we talk about uh, when we talk about particularly the the Revolutionary War and the founders we talk about Freemasonry, and we talk about deism, and we talk about the Stamp Act, and we talk about all these things, they're very important. Don't get me wrong. The, the people that actually made the laws, and made the Constitution, and made the Bill of Rights, and signed the Declaration of Independence, all that paperwork is very important, and I don't want to undermine it, but the guys who were willing to go out and fight and die, and do the soldiering, and protect their neighborhoods, and their families, and their churches, it's really important that we not forget those guys because those are the guys that actually made all of this stuff possible. So I want to read an account from uh, Levi Preston. He was interviewed um, at the age of 91 about what it was like to respond to the alarm on Lexington Green, go out there and, and fight with the British. And technically, the militia lost that battle. The Redcoats uh, were able to outnumber and beat the Lexington militia. They marched on to Concord, and then they came back. And by the time they got back to where the Lexington battle had been, militias from surrounding towns were there and uh, were able to pick off British regulars all the way back to Boston. So, so a historian asked Captain Preston, what made you go to the Concord fight? What did I go for, the old man replied, subtly rephrasing the historian's question. The interviewer tried again. Were you oppressed by the Stamp Act? I never saw any stamps, Preston answered, and I always understood that none were ever sold. What about the tea tax? Tea tax? I never drank a drop of the stuff. The boys threw it all overboard. But I suppose that you had been reading Harrington, Sidney, and Locke about the eternal principles of liberty. I never heard of these men. The only books we had were the Bible, the Catechism, Watts's Psalms and Hymns, <clears throat> and the Almanacs. Well then, what was the matter? And he answers, young man, what we meant in going for those red coats was this. We had always governed ourselves, and we always meant to, and they didn't mean that we should. So this is, this is the words of an actual militia man who responded. And, and these soldiers, the guys that actually were willing to put their lives on the line, are worth studying and reading about, not only just to see how they did what they did, but why they did what they did. And so as we uh, want to learn about communications technology or the ability to do certain things so that we have the tools in our toolkits to um, just be better at taking care of our families and our own neighborhoods, um, it's important that we read after action reports of different types of action so that we can determine what worked and what didn't. But also better understanding the people is a very important part of that. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be true when you're building your communications network as well. You're going to want to understand the people who are in your communications network.
um, and, and have actual relationships with them and actual understanding about um, what they uh, what they think and what they believe. That's going to be a really important part about building the sort of trust um, that these guys had in one another. So that when some random, not really random, but when some Boston goldsmith rides up with Intel, people who trust him uh, are actually ready to take action uh, on that Intel. So that's something to really think about, which isn't to say that you should stop asking me questions about which radio you should buy, but you should, uh, you should start thinking through the actual practical applications of what you want to accomplish with communication, and then make some of your radio-based uh, decisions um, with that mission in mind. So thank you very much for watching the stream. Thank you very much for uh, sending me so many questions about radios, uh, even the ones that I don't know how to answer. That's uh, 90% of them. Uh, and thank you very much for being interested in building the kind of communications network and the kind of capabilities that, um, that we're talking about today. Not just, not just talking to each other because it's cool to do it over the radio instead of Instagram, but uh, actually wanting to build the capabilities to, uh, to help people. So thank you for watching T-Rex Arms, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you guys around on the various, various social media platforms uh, that we don't control and can't trust anybody on. Uh, I'll see you on those platforms next week, Wednesday, 4.30. Have a great week.